There are many advocates like me who like to complain about inner city rail travel in the United States. For reasons that are well known, it doesn't measure up to most of the developed world in nearly every way. I think fixing our domestic rail system should obviously be the priority, but since I don't have any particularly novel insight on the matter at this time, I want to talk about something a little different. International passenger rail. I recently had the pleasure of taking a train under the English Channel between London and Paris, and it was honestly a transformative experience. My journey left me with one major question. If traveling between two countries can be this phenomenal, why would we not prioritize international rail travel whenever possible? Most of the time, traveling outside of the United States isn't very easy. If you're flying between two countries in the EU, it's probably better due to the general lack of customs processing, but overall, I don't mean to single out customs as the biggest pain. Honestly, it's airports and air travel, really everything about it. Sure, planes are cool and I've had some decent experiences, but your mileage really does vary depending on a multitude of factors. It's just such a hassle, such a generally uncomfortable and stress-inducing experience. It's also not very good for the environment, which is something that I care about a lot. For some journeys, there's really no other way. If you live in California and you need to go to China, of course you're gonna be flying. But what about, say, a trip between New York City and Toronto? These cities are close by, relatively speaking, and make up what is clearly an extremely popular city pair for air travel. But what if there was a better way to get between these two places? An easy, safe, comfortable, fast, and climate-friendly way, just like I had experienced in Europe. Maybe something that uses steel wheels and railroad tracks. You're in for some good news and some bad news. The good news is that you can take a train between the US and Canada in several areas. The bad news is you'll be extremely frustrated to know that in general, international rail travel here is generally non-existent or hilariously inadequate. I'm here to discuss why this is such a missed opportunity, review my experience on board the international Eurostar train in Europe, and talk about some ideas on what we can do to improve here. Let's dive in. First, a few notes about my experience from Paris to London. Eurostar, soon to be Talus due to a recent merger, isn't even considered the cream of the crop of international rail travel on the continent. Yet, it blew away pretty much any passenger rail experience I've had in the US except for maybe Brightline in Florida, which I made a separate video about. Now, international rail in Europe has serious problems of its own. It isn't really feasible yet across many European countries, and I highly recommend this video by Adam Something, which details the challenges of and solutions to international rail travel there. But as the United States and Canada experience a sort of passenger rail renaissance, I see no reason why they shouldn't also aim high for future international rail connectivity. Here are a few things that I really enjoyed about my experience on Eurostar. First, it was high speed. The trains run at a maximum speed of 186 miles per hour outside of the channel tunnel and 100 miles per hour inside. This isn't as fast as newer high speed services like Italy's Freccia Rosa, but it blows away North America's only high speed train, the Acela Express, which has a current top speed of 150 miles an hour, though soon to be 160 once the new train sets arrive, and only on small small portions of the route. The trip time to London from Paris was about 2 hours and 15 minutes and covered about 212 miles or 340 kilometers. By comparison, New York City to Boston on the Acela is a slightly shorter travel distance of about 190 miles, but it takes 3 hours and 45 minutes to get between the two cities. And that's the premier domestic high-speed express service in the United States. Frankly, that's embarrassing, and it leaves a gaping hole in the market for tons of unnecessary flights. Now, what about if I wanted to take the train between, say, New York City and Toronto? Well, here's where we run into even bigger problems. The cities are about 345 miles apart as the crow flies, but obviously that's not how the train flies, so if we took a roundabout way to get there, we're looking at maybe 500 to 550 miles if we try to hit some of the other cities in New York. If this were a high speed route, it would probably take about four hours at the absolute worst, given an average speed of maybe 136 miles per hour. Ideally though, there would be a much more direct route linking the two cities, but even four hours would pull a lot of customers away from airlines. However, the train that does operate on this route, 
the Maple Leaf, jointly operated by Amtrak and Via Rail, takes a whopping 12 and a half hours if there are no delays. That's pretty unacceptable. Another option to get to Canada from New York City has been the Adirondack, which should be returning soon. This route is much more direct and adds up to only 381 miles, which is prime high-speed rail distance. However, as it stands, the trip time is about 11 hours. You'd think the very biggest cities in the world's first and eighth largest economies would be better connected. Now, there's another obvious candidate for international rail travel in Seattle, Washington to Vancouver, British Columbia. Even if it could do better, the trip time of four hours really isn't bad. That seems to me like a great service that I'd much prefer to flying. However, there is only one train in each direction per day, so unless you happen to be able to leave Seattle at 7.45 in the morning, you're out of luck. Frequency is really an underrated issue in transit in general, but especially in high potential rail corridors like this. Even if the trip time is perfectly acceptable, you really have no flexibility with many of these routes, which is a big shame since it would probably unlock lots of demand. Speaking of frequency, let's talk about what my options were to get to London. I had the opportunity to choose from 13 trains per day in the middle of the week, some running as frequently as every 30 minutes during peak times, which is the frequency on some parts of the Washington DC metro, for example. And yet the Eurostar travels between countries separated by a large body of water, pulling consists of up to 18 coaches. This gives people so much flexibility when it comes to traveling in a short a huge reason for the services ridership, which is multiple times greater than, say, the Acela Express. So compare that again with the best international rail service in North America, the Amtrak Cascades, and I say best lightly. 13 trains versus just one. Of course, the London-Paris city pair is significantly more populated than Seattle-Vancouver, so maybe it's a bit of an unfair comparison, but it's obvious that these cities deserve so much more than just one round trip per day. Besides, the Maple Leaf and Adirondack aren't any better. North America just deserves so much more. I'm hopeful that someday we'll get there. There are preliminary plans for a high-speed Portland to Vancouver line, but even if that does happen, and that's a big if, it's quite a ways, many decades in the future. The other point I wanna make is just how high quality the trip itself was on Eurostar, ignoring the logistics. The train was clean, quiet, smooth, and with my standard premiere ticket, we were treated to a fantastic service that included the delicious breakfast. While I don't think Amtrak lags quite as much in this department, its first class Acela service doesn't even really compare to this, which says a lot. I guess that further proves the point that we really do need to prioritize fixing our domestic rail services, but as time goes on, I hope that at least the low-hanging fruit of international routes aren't completely forgotten about. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I appreciate your continued support. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you next time.